This show may contain explicit language and or spoilers. Welcome to the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast. Tonight we bring you number 46, Apollo 13. I'm Tom Duncan. And I'm Dana Duncan. And tonight we're bringing you our long-awaited Apollo 13 episode discussion. Uh, It's been a couple of weeks that we've been promising this one, so we're finally going to get to it. But first, we have a few new ways to follow the show. So some very exciting things. First, we have a new Instagram page. Uh, The current handle is at gmoat, G-M-O-A-T podcast. Or you can find it under the heading The Greatest Movie of All Time Podcast, where we will be putting up classic behind-the-scenes Hollywood photos on an almost daily basis that you can follow. There will be some additional trivia if I ever let Dana into the account, and uh, we'll be doing some fun things over there that you can help follow the uh, show on as we kind of move forward into Season 2, kind of expand our reach. Second, if you have not signed up for our new email list each week, When we have a new episode released, please either subscribe on our connected web links in the show notes or email us directly at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com. Again, that is greatestalltimemoviepodcast, one word, at gmail.com. Third, I have mentioned it before, but you can follow along with each episode, see each individual score breakdown on an individual movie, or find the whole list of movies and their rankings so far by clicking either of the links I embed in each set of show notes on every episode. If you simply click on the episode in your streaming service, they are right there for you. That's all there is to it. So, Dad, we had kind of a health scare with you last week. First off, how are you doing? And second, are you ready to discuss Apollo 13? First, I'm fine, and second, yes, I am. I know this is one of your favorites, so let's get right into it. As we do each week, let's jump to a basic plot summary and uh, overview the recognition for this movie. So, this Hollywood drama is based on events of the Apollo 13 lunar mission. Astronauts Jim Lovell, played by Tom Hanks, Fred Hayes, played by Bill Paxton, and Jack Swigert, played by Kevin Bacon, find everything going according to plan after leaving Earth's orbit. However, when an oxygen tank explodes, the scheduled moon landing is called off. Subsequent tensions within the crew and numerous technical problems threaten both the astronauts' survival and their safe return to Earth. This was nominated for Best Supporting Actor for Ed Harris, playing Gene Kranz, Supporting Actress Kathleen Quinlan for Marilyn Lovell, Adapted Screenplay, Visual Effects, Original Score, and best picture it won for best film editing and sound and the afi in 2005 ranked this as the number 50 movie quote of all time houston we have a problem as well as in 2006 number 12 on their 100 cheers list so dad what is your relationship to this movie well when i was a kid uh this would have been a spring of 70 so i think i was in kindergarten uh is when the um Situation happened with Apollo 13. Um, I don't remember much about Apollo 11 or Apollo 12, but 13 was embedded in my memory because of the uh, explosion and and the problems on it. It's at that point I started uh, regularly clipping out all of the articles on each Apollo launch and putting them into a scrapbook and kept track of everything for Apollos 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and the Apollo 18, which was Apollo Soyuz, and uh, kept track of it. So after that, I became quite the uh, uh, NASA fan. When I found out that Tom uh, Tom Hanks was going to star in it and that Ron Howard was going to direct it, I knew this was going to be an excellent film. Um, I figured that uh, when I found that uh, creative consultant was going to be Jim Lovell, I thought there was going to be an air of authenticity to it. They did deviate in the film, but I do remember seeing it at the theater and being in love with it. I thought it was an extremely well-done movie and uh, really uh, was impressed, and it's one of the movies that I will tend to watch whenever it's on. 
from a technical standpoint, they did take a couple of very small liberties for uh, dramatic effect, particularly when it comes to uh, how long after they turned on the oxygen tanks did the uh, explosion happen. But all of the things that you could point to as saying inaccurate are very minor by comparison to other movies, uh, particularly another movie from this year that won Best Picture that we'll be getting to later in the show. So I, I really would say this is a great historical accuracy movie as far as Hollywood standards is there because they used a lot of the dialogue that was uh, transmitted back on radios to the astronauts in order to get most of that right. They used a lot of uh, consultants in order to make sure that a lot of the science was correct and a lot of the uh, descriptions was uh, as accurate as possible. So I certainly look for it in, in that regard. But as far as my relationship to it, I do remember this one coming out on probably VHS because this was 1995. And watching this as, as a kid the first time with you and with mom. And I don't think I ended up staying up for the movie. I think I had to watch it like the next morning or something because it got too late for me. And that's telling you how old I must have been when I first watched this one. Because I remember getting up in the morning, or excuse me, before I went to bed, I distinctly remember asking you, well, do they live? Because I had no idea what any of this was going into it. Now, most people, obviously, that were adults probably knew at least of what had happened. But as a kid... And knowing the drama, this movie does a great job of kind of keeping that out of mind, creating the suspense and all of the thrills that you need in order for a movie like this to be as successful as it ended up being. So I, I think that was a great job by uh, Ron Howard. But this is also, in context, one of um, that Tom Hanks runs of the mid-90s. Now, moving forward, as a lot of 90s movies were, this was a cable classic, and Really, after that first viewing, I don't remember sitting down and ever watching in its entirety this film. I remember catching bits and pieces of it on TNT or TBS or whatever moving forward for a lot of years, but never anything in its entirety until we sat down to watch this movie. And when you sit down and you watch it in its entirety, you remember exactly why this was A, a heralded movie at the time, and B why we're even doing it for this list because this movie still works so we will get to that in a second but what do you think this movie is about it's about men overcoming obstacles uh, men drawing together and i use the term men more generic mankind people drawing together for the benefit of a project a greater goal and overcoming almost impossible odds. I relate this very similarly to another movie that Tom Hanks is famous for, uh, Castaway, because it's, it's a very similar type of premise that essentially they're stranded out in space. Now, in a completely different sense, one, he has a couple of other people with him, but two, uh, there are people that he has to work with in order to be able to get him home, whereas he has to create and fend for himself and survive but there are a lot of elements of survival this is a disaster movie and there is just a, a simplicity in a historical drama like this that is accurately based that the only basic premise is are these guys going to make it home and you do really don't need anything more than that in order to create the tension and just tell a good narrative story so, who did you think was your best performer for this one? Uh, Tom Hanks. I think Tom Hanks really did the uh, best job overall. I mean, he was the, the glue that kind of held the entire cast together. There were other great performances that I can, I'd can i be glad to note, but I think Hanks in and of himself was uh, really the center of the movie, and it was clear that Pretty much the entire cast built around him and played off him. So to the extent that he was there and was really in his element, I mean, this was a, the period where he was uh, as good of an actor as there was uh, in Hollywood and um, really did a fantastic performance in this. Ron Howard, his directorial career, not necessarily as a producer, but 
just as a director, has been kind of up and down as far as his hits or misses. But I think there's not only a strong argument, but I think it likely that this is probably his best movie. So I nominated him for my best performer because there's so many different elements to this movie. From the amount of technical skill that they had to do, the amount of difficulty that was uh, necessary in order to create the anti-gravity scenes in this and they were kind of pioneering in that regard all of the technical craftsmanship that went into telling the story the detail with which they did all of the historical accuracy every bit of element of that and then you start to throw in things like casting getting great performances out of small parts with minor performances the fact that this movie had two different uh, supporting actor award nominees and it was the only acting job i think it speaks to the high degree of acting chops that you had throughout this cast and a lot of people that went on to bigger parts bigger careers you had uh, gary sinise that had just come off of forrest gump tom hanks that had also come off of forrest gump you had just great actors all over the place we we already talked about ed harris uh, uh, for a second there you had obviously a uh, minor role for what kevin bacon had been up to this point i mean he'd been in such big movies just coming off of uh, a few good men a few years before this i mean there are a lot of really good actors in this and to be able to get all of those elements together bring that all together into something that worked when it very easily could have failed i think this by far might be his best full performance who earned your best secondary performer ed harris i think ed harris really did a great job overall playing this he really epitomized what you would imagine gene kranz to be which is in total control of uh, mission control uh, total control of operation a true crisis manager he just seemed to really take in the entire position and make it or the the, the part and make it himself it was a strong character and he played it as a strong character and i'm not sure there was a, still a, a sense of vulnerability i'm not sure how many actors could play a part that was that strong and still have an element of sympathy for this guy being put into this position and trying to deal with this crisis as he was so that's why i gave it to him I think there's something to be said that this is a part that could have very easily been overacted, and it really wasn't. That not only did you feel the strength in his character, but you felt almost optimistic every time that he had to be around uh, the movie or be in a central role. That there was a leadership quality to every piece of his portrayal. And so I, I think he definitely deserved a nomination for Best Supporting Actor. I do agree with the eventual decision because it went to Kevin Spacey for The Usual Suspects, and that was just a tough year. But uh, honestly, in any other year, Ed Harris could have easily taken home this award. My Best Secondary Performer was Tom Hanks. And I think it's for a lot of the reasons you mentioned, so I won't belabor the point a lot, but... This was kind of during his heyday. I mean, we, we talk about this 90s run that Tom Hanks had where we have the back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back movies that are just absolute knockouts, whether you talk about Forrest Gump or Philadelphia or this movie or Saving Private Ryan. I mean, there's just so many big ones in the 90s that he has and are, are just constantly hitting him out of the park when it, when it comes to big, heavy movies. And, uh, you know, it's no coincidence that he ends up winning two Best Actor awards and probably could have had uh, a slew of other awards during this period of time. I, I think he was the preeminent lead actor at this point, and it, it really wasn't close. But in this particular instance, he does a great job of being the anchor of the movie about, uh, around which everything revolves, as you mentioned before. And he does a great job of grappling between being at a breaking point but still being able to lead the crew that you see the leadership qualities of someone like a jim lovell who could lead them through such an incredibly difficult situation but you also see the vulnerability and the desperation in being in probably the most difficult situation you could ever play someone and 
there's just so many small pieces to his portrayal that uh, I could highlight, but you've kind of hit on several of them already, that he just, there. there's really no way to completely quantify how good Tom Hanks was during the mid-90s. All right. Um, most charismatic award. I actually gave it to Ed Harris. I, I think this is a, a surprising one when you, you think of charismatic, but I think this was one of the best roles or best uses of him that, again, it, it highlights the strength and the things that uh, I was talking about before, but there's a certain level of optimism and, I don't know, pride every time he seems to end a scene or has to deliver some big line in, in the movie, and they do it in just the right way, that it's stitched together in such a way that he kind of provides that it's going to be okay, the reassurance mode in everything that's going wrong. And when you're in a very difficult and tense situation, because I, I think this movie could have gotten very heavy, very tense, very difficult to watch, but this is an endlessly re- rewatchable movie for in one particular direction that I, I will talk about a lot when we get to the scoring. And this movie never really drags. Part of that has to be that He's there to be reassuring, much in the same way Tom Hanks is. Every time that the situation turns or that you would think that this is getting to be too much or that the uh, audience can't handle any more pressure to this incredibly difficult situation. And for that, I think he deserves the most charismatic. Who did you have? Clint Howard. Really? No, I'm kidding. Uh, I was going to say, he's on for like... Brother does. He's on for only like three minutes of time. <laughs> Next, you're going to say I, Gary I could have given it to Tom Hanks, and I could have given it to Ed Harris, but simply because I didn't want to leave him out because I really like him as an actor, I'm going to give it to Gary Sinise. I, I just, uh, I think that he is a, a, a consummate actor. Uh, he had not done movies until you know, more recent. He basically after Howard cast, uh, Hanks, um, he offered on Hanks is urging whatever part in the movie outside of Lovell that Sinise wanted. And so he ended up picking Mattingly and, uh, Ken Mattingly. And I just really think he did a nice job. He became kind of a, the secondary hero in the, the movie um, he has a presence on the screen and just comes across very well and thought that he did a very nice job and, and really controlled the scenes that he was in for the most part. Agreed. Uh, I would like to mention, I think we need to have Mom back for when we do the Forrest Gump episode now that we're talking about Gary Sinise. I uh, won't um, <laughs> undercut why. But you have that one to look forward to, folks. Yes. All right, let's move to best scene. Uh, do you have a first nominee? I, I like the uh, the actual Houston, we have a problem scene. That's a, a key one. That uh, So I'll start with that one. I think that that scene really is the centerpiece of the film, and that's the part that most people automatically gravitate towards and uh it it puts it, it's kind of the pivotal moment uh converting the movie from we're going to the moon to we need to save ourselves or save the crew yeah it is the separating or the crucible moment where the comp- movie completely turns although given the knowledge of the episode or the historical reference point, I think most people anticipate it, so they they can see what is coming. So I, I think it's an anticipation of that, oh, when is the shit going to hit the fan? And when it comes, that there isn't this level of uh, immediate anticipated panic. There, there is concern, there are people scrambling, but it's not like everybody going into full meltdown. And the the level of competence that was in there, I think unless you got the true historical nature of that scene correctly, people would not necessarily believe that, oh, what are we going to do now? 
didn't become an immediate thing because I think the rest of us would sympathize with somebody just completely panicking as most of us would be. But I think it takes a real recognition of what these guys had to go through in order to get to that point as astronauts in order to appreciate the endeavor that they were on. All right. So my first nominee, I think this is a very underrated scene. I would dare say that if anybody else reviewed this movie, they wouldn't think of it. But this scene struck me so true immediately. I I thought, oh my goodness, this is just a well-done piece of writing and uh, exposition without being true exposition. So, or Lovell's wife, Marilyn, ends up waking up from a nightmare of everything going wrong with the Apollo mission. Obviously, foreshadowing the the actual problems that were to come and i think to a certain degree this has got to be the relatable side of the bystander character that this is somebody that when everything goes wrong is so helpless and you relate to them if i had my significant other or a family member or somebody i really loved or cared about and they were in a dire situation like this how would i react i think the audience is placed most closely in her shoes but then instead of just giving this basic overview of setting the tone of the level of danger that they're in they use this nightmare sequence followed immediately by her waking up and going to look for jim and he's in with his son and then you see the wonder but also the worry and concern of a small child that doesn't understand the complexities of when something could go wrong in a mission. All they understand is, are you going to come home? And there's a small scene when he's with his son that is just so beautifully done that I think is relatable to any parent or anybody that's ever put themselves in that situation of, yes, you're going out to do this incredibly dangerous and difficult thing. And we look at it only from the side sometimes of what are the possibilities of space travel. But we almost rarely look at all of the dangers and the downsides, even though a lot of space movies have become kind of disaster movies. Look at something like Gravity that uh, nearly won Best Picture um, uh, a few years back. These are the types of things that set up why this is such a great movie because it does that world building in the early parts of this movie in such a great understated way. And I think for being such a small scene, I took so much out from that, that small interplan exchange that really set up what the tone was going to be for this, this film. And I think when you have a film, it's most successful if it does well in those minor moments. And this one did. What's your next nominee? Uh, Ken Mattingly in The Simulator. Just the sheer fact that uh, the amount of repetition that he had to go through in order to get the sequence and try to figure out how they were going to power up the craft again so that they could do their reentry. It was intricate. It was detailed. It was, you know, it, it showed the level of patience uh, that was required by somebody in order to to effectuate the, uh, the the mission coming back and or the return mission and what they needed to do and all the different parts that were there. It just it summarized to me the level of perfection that he sought in general. And a lot of people at NASA, I think, uh, I think it was more of a, uh, a tribute to the level of perfection that NASA itself tried to seek at that time. Honestly, how he doesn't become immensely frustrated and just, like, have these anger outbursts is almost beyond me. Because if it were me, I'd be screaming so many profanities at the modulator or the simulator that you couldn't show it to anybody under the age of, like, 25. All right, my next one, uh, and I think it ended up being a very powerful scene, and I think it's probably the one that got her nominated for Best Supporting Actress, but the uh, what I will name the Take It Up With My Husband, He'll Be Home On Friday. I think that was just a great finality line, because for 
uh, all of the things they'd been building to that point with the broadcast to Earth that nobody saw, that nobody was interested in, all of a sudden something goes wrong and all of the attention turns once there's this uh, negative attention to it. People want to see the car crash that now we're going to uh, really overload ourselves by putting TV cameras that basically every TV camera that exists on her front lawn and watch these people in such a glass fish bowl to make sure that they're not cracking under pressure, but you're just adding to it. And she defiantly is able to just brush them aside and deliver such a great line. Obviously I think that's, that's a dramatized version of it, but it it was just such a a beautiful and well-placed line that, um, gave such a level of strength and optimism in that moment of difficulty and the resolve that was there. You just admire somebody's level of tenacity in order to be able to do that. I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but it was just a favorite moment in the movie for me. I'm going to nominate the CO2 scene um, where the um, mission control comes to Kranz and says, you know, we, we, have a problem in the scrubbers trying to take out the carbon dioxide out of the air. And then the whole group of engineers at NASA take a bag full of uh, junk and try to figure out how they're going to convert a square filter into a round filter by using just stuff available in the capsule. It's the ultimate group project. (laughs) I hated group projects, so it's nice to see a group project that actually worked. There are so many intricate portions to that scene, and I honestly, I think they could have probably gone longer for the amount of small things that probably had to go into fixing such a very unique problem, and I would have enjoyed it that much more. I'm glad to a certain extent that they didn't focus on it, because this isn't a minutia movie, even despite its historical accuracy. It didn't make it a, a... huge portion of the movie because the movie isn't revolving around all the technicalities of what it made to be space and space travel to that point it did involve those things but it wasn't the true part of the story and what this movie was about it was about trying to get these guys home and so i i understand the choices but for a theater nerd and somebody who enjoys a lot of the scientific background, I could have used a, a small extra scene, and I, I'd be curious if I got the D, a hold of the DVD version of this, if there was a scene that they maybe cut where they went into a little bit more detail about the planning meeting or how they ended up resolving that situation. Let's do the opening here. I'll, I'll nominate that one next. So we focus on the Apollo 11 mission, and I think to a certain extent... At this point, now that we've done this movie, we've done First Man, we did a documentary on Apollo 11, and we've had so many historical records of, because last year was the 50th year, I think this is a little overplayed, but in 1995, maybe it had become somewhat lost, how momentous and historically defining the first walk on the moon was. And this movie does a great job of dropping you into this world where space travel is not just expected, but it's full of possibilities of what the world could become. And it it takes you into that feeling of wonder that I'm sure everybody had in 69 watching that for the first time. It does a great job of using that as its setup scene, its environment, its world building to basically take you, okay, why are we doing this for space? And one of the lines that uh, is additionally added to it after the fact uh, is going to be one of my nominees for best lines that uh, I'll add to it eventually. But they do a great job of not only setting why we were going to the moon and not making it about just the space race or beating the Russians or something else, but that it gives you that sense of a pride in humanity at large, that we were accomplishing things that were thought to be at one time gigantic feats. And I I think from Lovell looking up at the moon, watching the telecast, all the small pieces that went into that moment that reminded you of what it is, or the appreciation they had at the time for what a momentous moment that was, I, I think works really well, and it, it's a great piece of writing and directing. 
I'm going to nominate the measles scene where they have to tell Ken Manningly that he's been exposed to the measles. He hasn't had the measles, so therefore he has to stay. It, just the sheer fact of what Lovell had to go through and being in a command position, it was a um, tough decision no matter what took place and to watch how he made the decision and ultimately took responsibility for the final decision was uh, kind of a, a, a nice study in what is command. There, There's so much complexity, and it could have been pushed aside that that was something that was reverted to, but they, they took the time to really emphasize not only why it was such a, an importance for Jim Lovell to... Uh, want to go in the first place, but that he ultimately had to make a sacrifice of somebody else in his command in order to have the opportunity, you know, that he was really pushing. He wanted to be one of the guys to have walked on the moon and why it was such a a big deal for that. And ultimately it, it pays off in this decision. And by the same token, the way Sinise plays Mattingly, he could have been bitter and self-defeating and really wanted nothing to do with this, but immediately he jumps at the chance while he's disappointed in not being able to go. He just jumps up when there's a problem and he's the first one in to try and do the things that he needs to do to get his friends home. And I, I appreciate that about both people that they rise above the circumstance, even though it's unfortunate for each of them in in some regards. One, that Jim has to make that decision in the first place, and two, that Ken has to not only uh, stomach it, but stomach it quickly in order to help in a obviously disastrous situation. I will go with my last scene, and it's also my nominee for my favorite scene. I think that in a lesser director's hands, we would have gotten the three minutes that they are in re-entry and we would have gotten it from the first person perspective. For most of this movie, we have we're with uh, Swigert and Lovell and Fred Hayes, and we get them from a first person perspective. But during those three minutes, Howard makes such a great choice to take them out of the equation completely and focus only on what everybody else was watching. Not only does it extremely eloquently build the tension but creates this feeling of relief immediately when you see the splashdown and for everybody watching at home you completely relate to the same sense that they had Uh, you can only imagine i mean it's the first time they feature jim lovell's eldest son who happened to be in military school in milwaukee no less you know shout out to our, our wisconsin roots here but that you can only imagine what he was going through sitting in a tense moment watching to see if his dad was going to survive on TV with his classmates. I mean, they do such a great job of putting you in everybody's shoes. And again, a lesser director would have given us that first-person experience, but by doing that small little interchange and giving us this complete blackout, not knowing whether it was going to turn out, even though you may know in the historical record, you still have a certain hold-your-breath notion with that scene that's incredibly powerful and so i i think honestly i i think it's not only my favorite scene it's probably the best scene from this movie i have one last and that's the power-up scene i like that uh you know what they had to go through and and they're you know they've been going through this whole process and now they've got to try to figure out how they're going to do this and they're they have to find some inner strength some inner energy because they haven't eaten properly they haven't slept um, they've been under constant stress and then they have to do all this and a lot of times is with you know they have to write down the procedures and follow them and and be walked through it and everything else and it was um, it was a scene that really showed and finding your inner resolve and finishing up what you needed to do so out of all of these nominees, what is the best scene and your favorite scene? I basically already made my choices. Well, the best scene, I think, ultimately is that pivotal moment with the Houston, we have a problem. As far as my favorite scene, 
<clears throat> I just go back again to the whole thing with Ken Mattingly and the simulator. Just it just when when you see somebody who's willing to put that kind of effort into being precise and to to be as perfect as possible, I just have a high level of respect for something like that. And so to me that's that kind of is just me. I, I think that's a very a scene that I enjoyed tremendously and, and um, had a lot of respect for. All right. Um, what is your most indelible moment? Well, there's two, and I had a hard time because obviously the, the two lines that most people take away is Houston, we have a problem. The other is, which is Gene Kranz, Ed Harris, you know, failure is not an option. And so I think that those are the two scenes that are more burned into my memory from anything. Honestly, that was actually the second line from Ed Harris's character that I, I took away. The one I thought was much more powerful to me in that moment is, is, sir, with all due respect, I think this will be our finest moment. Because there's there's a weird pride that, that comes in when that line's delivered. And I thought that was a much more powerful line, whereas, yes, he's showing leadership in the failure is not an option, but, I mean, what are you expecting him to say? I mean, it's kind of obvious that that's the situation. All right, so that's a good stopping point. We will be right back after this commercial break. And now I want to tell you about Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It gives you smart creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone, tablet, or computer and helps you distribute them to all the major platforms like Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, and more. Plus, they help to hook you up with sponsorships like this one no matter the listener size, which will help help you fund your podcast. And best yet, it's free to use. Look, if you've ever had an itch to talk and express yourself about a topic you like, there is no better time than 2020 to do so. I've started two podcasts this year alone, including this one, and we use Anchor for each and every episode. So what do you have to lose? Download the free Anchor app and or go to anchor.fm to get started making your own podcast today. Welcome back. Let's jump into Best Lines. Uh, What's your first nominee, Pop? Let me just get my note here up. I don't care about what anything was designed to do. I care about what it can do. I have a similar one from him that uh, as long as we're on the situation, it's one we just mentioned uh, before the break. We've never lost an American in space. We're sure as hell not going to lose one on my watch. Failure is not an option. Again, I think you promptly mentioned that this one is one that a lot of teams, or not teams, a lot of people have taken away from this movie. So I... I think it obviously needs inclusion. It's a central turning point of the movie. Well, my line, I picked it because that kind of almost is the epitome of crisis management. Part of being my profession as a lawyer is sometimes you have individuals who are suffering from a significant loss or a problem, and you become a crisis manager. And so this one, you know, you want the facts. (laughs) You're trying to figure out what... You can what things are available to you that you can use, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to uh, be able to have it for what it was intended to. You need some things available to repurpose, and that's really what we're talking about here. All right, my next nominee, and this comes from that early scene that I mentioned beforehand, the kind of that opening where Jim is talking to his wife and kind of um, expressing the wonder and admiration of space travel. But from now on, we live in a world where man has walked on the moon, and it's not a miracle. We just decided to go. I think it's a very simple summation of a complex and nuanced idea within a very short line. Just a great bit of writing as far as I'm concerned. Um, the line that uh, uh, Gene Howard, Ron's mother, did that played uh, Blanche Lovell. Are you scared? Well, don't you worry, honey. If they could get a washing machine to fly, my Jimmy could land it. 
there are so many of those small reassurances throughout this this movie, and that's another example of them that we kind of have already touched on a bit before. There are several Gene Krantz moments like that, Ed Harris's character, and Marilyn Lovell. There are a lot of these bystander moments where they're reassuring the audience, and again, I think in concert, those all work well to not make this too heavy of a movie or subject like some disaster movies can be where it gets a little bit too much for me. I have a problem watching things like Castaway where the the situation almost gets so depressing and sad and I I just have a a difficult time with that even though he makes it at the end of the movie. And I'm not even going to bother saying spoilers. The movie's friggin' 20 years old. Go watch it. But... (laughs) I mean, yeah, we, we point, need to I set a, a, a spoilers alert, alert well, filter. I mean, I do disclaim it at the beginning of the episode, but that's beside the point. Besides, are, uh, uh, I'll give you a spoiler. They make it back. Yeah. Read a history so, book. The, the point being that this movie could very easily go into that territory, and it does a very good dance of never quite getting past a precipice moment where this movie becomes too much for the average viewer. It's always palatable and wavers between those where it's optimistic that they're going to make it and yet uh, also expresses the concern level so there's still some anxiety to the movie and it's uh, why it ultimately is successful in my opinion. So uh, uh, there's, a, there's a few other lines that I like to again with Ed Harris. Let's work the problem people. Let's not make things worse by guessing. Uh, I mentioned this one before, but I, again, I, I think it's worthy of nomination uh, so, since we're on the Gene Kranz line or lines. Uh, the NASA director. This could be the worst disaster disaster NASA's ever experienced. With all due respect, sir, I believe this is going to be our finest hour. And then, again, it's on the same level, so I, I don't need to go into too much of the context on that one. Uh, all right, I'll nominate a, a different one from kind of a, a different section of the movie, and it's before they go up into space and, and the rest of it. And it, you know that everybody in a certain level is somewhat superstitious, and they kind of make this into a small dramatization, but I think it's a, a cute little throwaway line for a moment that kind of makes them a little bit more human. Naturally, it's 13. Why 13? It comes after 12, hon. <laughs> uh, it sounds like such wife. a line that you would give. Yeah, I know. It's such a wife line. Well, and it's such a smart-ass response. <clears throat> I played the Fifth Amendment on that. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, did you have any other major lines? I, I have a couple of them. Lovell, we just lost the moon. Yeah, I, I think that one is in there. The obvious, most famous one, so I'll, I'll mention it with it. Houston, we have a problem. I think we would be fools not to nominate that one. Who are we smarter than the AFI who had it is number 50 on their list. But uh, one of the other ones I, I want to mention that are the level lines in space that kind of uh, give the gravity of the situation and kind of ground us in the seriousness of what was going on. Uh, I'll be waking, or excuse me, I'll be walking in a place where there's 400 degrees difference between sunlight and shadow. I can't imagine ever topping that. Did you have any others from that Lowell section of the movie? You never know what events are going to transpire to get you home. I mean, there's a reason why in these, or why NASA picked pilots as opposed to scientists or whoever. To do the to be astronauts because they were used to dealing with pressure situations. They were used to dealing with adversity. They were used to dealing with complications and stress. And that's what you ultimately had to have. Is even though that you could probably train them, they had certain reflexes and actions and abilities that flew through their life experiences that just put them in a better position to do this. I mean, I still can't understand how a human being can fly a jet that can break the sound barrier 
and land on an aircraft carrier, which is barely larger than the f- a football field, and rely on a, a, a cable with a tail hook and do this repeatedly and not go insane. I know we didn't nominate it for uh, best scenes, but the the launch sequence and you know all of the things that, that go into that, you're basically strapped to this giant propelled missile and you you just have to watch that you have to watch the the splashdown scene and you realize that this is something that uh almost nobody else on earth is going to be capable of doing you have to be one of the most trained individuals in order to achieve space travel this isn't like star wars you just get in the millennium falcon and go this is a completely different enterprise that they put you in the middle of and give you that experience. You're strapped to the top of an explosion. Yeah. That's That's what it is. You're strapped to the top of an explosion and you're supposed to be able to control your emotions enough in order to function in that ad or in that uh, environment. I think that's why a movie like gravity worked as well as it did is it sets up a lot of those sim- similar situations of the high stress calculation when things just start to go wrong and the amount of um, just unnatural difficulties and problem solving that have to go into your calculations in order to survive anything because the smallest issue in space becomes amplified by a hundred easily. I've mentioned this a few different times, which is this uh, fight or flight uh, dichotomy that people have. And what tends to happen is, is the reason people make poor decisions under stress is, is that their body naturally draws blood away from the brain and the internal organs to the external organs so you can flee. So it, it engorges the muscles in the legs and the arms so you can get out of the out of there. As a result, people have a tendency to make poor decisions. The ability of certain parts of the population to not have that happen so that their brains have sufficient energy and sufficient blood and oxygen to make intelligent decisions is key. My guess is is if you looked at these test pilots, most of them were test pilots, not just fighter pilots or jet pilots or bomber pilots. They were test pilots which even had higher risk and higher incidence of death. And I think you'd find that a large portion of these guys, if not all of them, had that ability, which is under stress, they were able to think coolly and clearly, whereas everyone else around them would uh, be in chaos. I'm going to ground us back with a, a different line I'd like to nominate. That's early on in the film, but I think hit me with a a ton of impact that I wasn't anticipating. Congressman. Now, Jim, people in my state keep asking why we're continuing to fund this program now that we've beaten the Russians to the moon. Jim Lovell. Imagine if Christopher Columbus had come back from the New World and no one returned in his footsteps. And it reminds me, we're now a couple of years into this private enterprise um, space exploration, so SpaceX. Uh, Tesla and all all of that stuff going on. And it makes me disappointed and sad. And and I don't mean to be simplistic in that. It it quite literally makes me sad that we're relying on private enterprise to pursue possibly the greatest endeavors we could achieve uh, in mankind. Space exploration. I, I know there are some people that contest that you know, exploring the depths of the ocean and mapping out the rest of our own world is a great thing. And I don't get me wrong, that's something that I uh, completely understand and agree with. But why we've decided to limit our scope and ability as a collective na- na- nationality or humanity in order to serve up to private enterprise on the notion of benevolence that they're the only ones now that have the the reins of what is possible, I think is telling of where we've come just generally 
as a as species. And, and I mean that in as quite sincere a mode as I can. I think there are so many things and tangible benefits to exploration of our environment, of our world, and it just continues to breed a certain sense of optimism. And it shows me an unfortunate growing emotion within uh, the the world or humanity at large that we become so cynical and don't look anymore to what the next thing is or what's possible or brimming optimism because we're so focused on all the negative around us and to me that's just sad it just simply is I, i'm disappointed in us i'm disappointed in my government and i'm uh, additionally disappointed that it's driven us to this point because obviously somebody needs to explore i'm glad to a certain extent that we do at least have some exploration i'm just sad that it has to come from people that are benevolent billionaires i think ultimately the problem is is it's not it's this linear thinking that we have which is if we're going to spend a dollar we need to have an immediate return for the dollar I just happened to be listening to MSNBC this morning, and they had a doctor on there discussing the uh, virus and the vaccines. And one of the things they commented was is that part of the reason that uh, um, we've been able to develop the vaccine so quickly was because the government had been funneling money into the CDC for for strange and unusual tactics or research or whatever and one of those areas that they did ended up becoming at the time they didn't know what they were going to do with it it looked like it could be helpful in some way but that apparently was what they started with when they developed the vaccine were able to do it so quickly and he commented the reason that we've been able to do it is the the billions of dollars that have been spent by bill clinton George W. Bush and Barack Obama uh, through the years to make headway in certain viruses and diseases that um, at the time people thought was a waste of money. But now, in retrospect, it's probably uh, a, uh, an excellent investment in our future. And that's the kind of thing. This, it's this whole stupid concept of two where you know, you get an edu- you go to college so you can get a job. Well, your job might be outdated in a few years. That's it's idiotic. What you should be doing is is trying to learn, and that's the problem. Uh, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Trying to get a job is not idiotic. Taking it only as the only reason to go to college is short-sighted. Okay, so fine. Clean up my language. The point I'm making is is that so many of the jobs that exist now that you go into, like I comment, when I was in high school, they kept telling me, oh, go into to a key punch operation. Do, you can talk to anybody under 40 and they're going to go, what? You know, that's the problem we have. And that's the, the thing that should come out of this from, from space itself, which is there are so many benefits that are tangential to the space program that have advanced America and advanced the world and advanced society as a result, that it, it's it's an investment that we just aren't making. And I, I don't understand why. It's almost it's almost a throwaway that you oh it's just not necessary or it's a waste of money. I don't agree. I, I I think this is a failure of leadership generally that we don't take a much long term or longer term view of any decision making. Ultimately that lies in the people that we are supposed to be leading us that set the tone and the view the vision of where we're go. supposed to be going. And I uh, I think that's the biggest thing. We've had a leadership vacuum for a long time. And for those few people that do have the vision, we don't give them enough amplification to show us the way we need to be going. Or, and maybe this is a bigger part of it, 
people aren't either willing to listen or just uh, are choosing to tune it out. So I, I think it's a multi-level thing. I don't want to get into a, a complete extrapolation and, and be a downer here. I, I just wanted to make one small point in a larger conversation that we could have on, on the subject. So I think it's quite obvious we, we need to put Houston, we have a problem because of its place within pop culture as probably the best line. But what is the sub best line? If we, if we eliminate that from the equation, what is the best line out of the rest? Uh, failure is not an option. It's, it's kind of like become the mantra for a lot of corporate culture, which is you have to succeed. You have to do what it takes in order to achieve your goal. You learn from failure. I understand that, and, and you know the mon- the the uh, mantra a lot of people have is is fail and fail and fail, and you'll learn how to not fail eventually. But you don't go into it with intent of failing. You go into it with intent of saying that failure is not an option, and you you it, you understand and accept if you fail, but you don't go into it with that concept. And so, to me, that's uh, that is a line that stands out significantly. This is the one place where I think failure wasn't an option, but ultimately I, I'm going to push back on this a little bit, and, and it's it, a point I think is worth making. To me, we haven't set up enough spaces where failure is an option. I think there is a gross culture that views failure as the ultimate association of unfortunately i almost have to use the word in the definition of failing that it is the ultimate negative that there is no lower than failing at something and that's not the case and i i think that especially in a corporate culture the the environments that end up doing best the ones that innovate the ones that are more developed on a teaching atmosphere where failure maybe not failure completely but mistakes or error is an accepted part of the learning process end up succeeding more often because they've tried new things and sometimes they don't work but they have to continue to move forward and now they know something that doesn't work they've learned something from that process and i don't want to get away from that because i think uh, i see this in my own life that i've been so afraid of taking a lot of uh, very basic chances out there and a lot of people oh you know what's the worst that could go wrong well when you're uh, completely terrified of ever failing at anything or being perceived as failing at something you're paralyzed from doing anything and that's the true failure so i I just want to in since we have a moment we have a small audience to relate this to i just think it's a point worth making so here's your the problem is is how you define failure okay i have in my legal practice i do social security disability work my goal is is to get my client who is ill or sick disability benefits it may take multiple failures. Ultimately, the goal is the same. It's the failure is not an option. The ultimate option, failure to get them on disability, is not an option. It's a matter of how many different tactics, techniques, ways, means. If you go go to a hearing, if you go to a federal court, you on and on and on. Yes, you're going to fail at some of these things, but the ultimate goal, that's where you have to draw the line. You're going to have multiples. You talk about failing. What's your ultimate goal? You're trying to get to a particular situation or particular thing. You're going to have failures, but and you grow through those failures, but to give up completely. Whether, you know, I hear people talk all the time about, well, I really would like to have a relationship that has meaning with somebody. But they're and they have multiple failed relationships. Okay, you learn from those, but the failure is giving up on the goal. That's the failure. But I think people go into it with the mindset that any hardship will ultimately, or any mistake 
misstep or otherwise ultimately ends up feeding into this sense of doom and gloom of failure. And I think that's a larger aspect of the general cynicism that's creeping in that we already alluded to. But again, I don't want to go completely off off topic here. So if there was one funniest line, I'll say it's the, it comes after 12. There, This wasn't a movie for a lot of funny lines per se, although there were some more contextual funny moments. I, I wouldn't say this is written to be that type of movie. I like the line about, um, uh, or if they could get a washing machine to fly, my Jimmy could land it. I don't see that as funny. I've never once laughed at that. It makes me smile because I think it really is intended to be, an, uh, a, to some extent, an, uh, or a kind of almost a cynical line. It's kind of meant to be a little bit funny. All right, so let's move into our Stanley rubric. Let's uh, jump into Legacy. What did you have down? You mentioned this film, and everybody is re- or instantaneously remembers it, and it has a um, a wide audience, a wide viewership, a wide. I mean, it leaves a wake in its path. So I, I came up with a nine for that reason. I mean, it's not like everybody's heard of it, but al- almost everybody. I think a lot of people have heard of this movie. They have an association with the name. But if you ask anybody what this movie's about, I I don't think it would be out of question to say only about 3 in 10 are going to accurately be able to st- tell you under the age of 50. And I, I don't know how much this movie lives in the public consciousness yet. I did say that it was a kind of one of those cable movies, but I, I, I don't know. And while it was... Uh, a you know in the immediate future or the the five years after it was talked about as one of the big oscar snubs because it went in as the oscar favorite for a long time going into that award season and didn't ultimately win i i don't think this is one of those that uh because it got kind of outplayed by a movie or uh, an award season a couple of years later the famous uh, saving private ryan year and so I don't even think people look at it in the, the same regard as that. Ron Howard did end up going on to kind of get redeemed by winning for another movie as Best Director that also got Best Picture. So he got his, like, crowning achievement moment in Hollywood that he's an Oscar winner and, you know, produced one of those movies. But I, I just don't see this as having a, a huge tale you know, from about 2000 on in the same way that maybe we think it does to you and I, because, you know, this has been one of your favorites. I think we're a little bit clouded to the general public's understanding of this movie. The one say saving grace I will put in here is it has an iconic pop culture moment, but I don't know if anybody associates that moment with this movie necessarily. Houston, we have a problem. So I gave it a 6.5. All right. Well, I th- it would be kind of interesting at some point when we uh, can actually have conversations with people that we don't know um, without fear or paranoia to just do it. You could go and take a movie and stand on a corner in uh, on State Street in Madison and just say, have you ever heard of this movie? And just mark it down for an hour and ask a uh, hundred people who has and what they know about the movie and just cross-reference it to what our findings are or what our statements are to see how accurate we are. I mean, both of us live in a bubble. I mean, I I deal with people who are all about my age because that's who I have in my world. So maybe I am clouded, but I don't know that. Well, no, and I think part of the exercise is to try and think outside of that. So we're trying to extrapolate as best as possible, but you did say an eight, right? I had a nine. You had a nine? A nine. We have not been that different in uh, varying degrees for a while. And I've talked about, I mentioned this to some of the people who are more or younger in my office who work for me, and they seem to have recognition of this movie and such. So, uh, again, that's where I'm coming from on this. So, okay. 
Impact Significance, I gave it an 8.5. And I, I think this is a movie that was bigger at the time it came out and has kind of lost steam over time, which is why I pretty much had it uh, bigger at the moment, or a bigger score for Impact Significance, and then a lower score after the fact. I think there were a lot of technical appreciations of this movie as being a really good disaster movie. The the writing was appreciative. I think Ron Howard got a certain level of esteem after this movie that uh, built him into being one of the celebrity or bigger directors, even though he uh, obviously had been around Hollywood, been um, a actor for a long time. People knew him, you know, obviously as uh, associated with Happy Days and um, Andy Griffith, but it, it put him as a director that had some regard attached to his filmmaking ability as opposed to what he had done as a child actor. And I think this was also a big movie because, again, it was an, a favorite to win Best Picture going into awards season. It was a popular box office movie. I mean, this was the number one movie in America, I think, for like four or five weeks, something like that. It was one of the highest revenue generators. This is kind of that era where we still had top box office finishers that were also awards worthy, where we've been slowly removed, where some of the best movies are very small movies because we've separated ourselves over what the movie going public is interested in watching as we've gone into a new era, especially in the last 10 years of what movies have become. I think this, if you list made a list of the top 10 movies of the nineties, this could very easily be on that list. This is easily one of the, the top ones for me, but I mean, there are a lot of good ones, but it's, it's on a short list. You, you talk about Pulp Fiction. Uh, I know it's controversial, but I think Forrest Gump, Saving Private Ryan, Titanic, maybe I, I don't particularly care for the film, although we haven't done a review on that one yet. You talk about, Shawshank Redemption, Silence of the Lambs, Schindler's, you know, Schindler's. Uh, but I think this movie is right in there in a very great decade of movies for Hollywood. So ultimately, I gave it an eight and a half. I gave it an eight. Uh, many of the same reasons, but I didn't go quite as high as you. Simply because I think uh, in, in as you just went through the list of films. There were so many good films that came out in the 90s that this one does at times seem to get lost a little bit. The fact that Ron Howard didn't get the acclamation for this film that he ended up getting for Cinderella Man marked it down a bit for me. Cinderella Man? Oh, excuse me. Beautiful Mind. Yeah. I misspoke. But I think he also did Cinderella Man later, he did. if I remember but it was a beautiful. It was a couple mind. of years yeah. after, and yeah. that's an okay movie, but it it, it certainly was not. I, I was surprised. I th- thought for sure he was nominated for best director for this, so I was a little surprised that he wasn't. Now that I go back and look and did all the notes he, for the show, he had a lot of lot to overcome being a child star. Sure. I mean, he did uh, he, you know the Music Man, Courtship of Eddie's Father, then Andy Griffith, then Happy Days. And then, he, you know, his first film is uh, Splash, and he's perceived more as being kind of a, not a serious uh, director. So I think it took a while for Hollywood to really recognize his skills. There's definitely a sentimentality to his storytelling that I think is a unique style, and that's why it's been hit or miss sometimes for him as a director is he, he the tone doesn't always match the subject but there when it works it just works and for this one it definitely worked so uh, that does give us a 7.75 for legacy and an 8.25 for impact significance novelty i went with a nine part of the reasoning is it's really the first true depiction of historical space travel and all of the difficulties with it. As I kind of mentioned, what we've gotten for space travel was based on science fiction. It was Star Trek or Star Wars. We've even discussed Alien a little bit. And a lot of it had to do with very easy space travel or stuff that really wasn't true to form. And the amount of technical difficulty that they had to go into making this movie, whether you're talking about the Vomit Comet or any of the anti-gravity measures that come along with it, uh, all of the historical accurate aspects that they really went through a lot of painstaking 
uh, ability to do, I think, was novel. They didn't try and take cheap outs. They really put a lot of energy and effort. And while that wasn't necessarily the focus of the movie, as I mentioned before, it certainly wasn't anything that detracted from the movie. There aren't any major glaring errors when it comes to this, uh, especially when you consider that it lost out in the Best Picture race to a film that's widely considered one of the most historically inaccurate films of all time, Braveheart. So, (laughs) yeah, I think that this is one of the, maybe not the first, but I, I, I think this is a highlighted movie or an essence of a dramatized type documentary that a lot of historical dramas have been based upon after the fact. And we hadn't really gotten a ton to the, I wouldn't say biopic, but historical drama type until movies like this. So I I think it does have a high level of novelty. I went with a nine. I went with an eight. And the reason why I went with the lesser number than you did is because I think you're forgetting a film that came out uh, about 1983, The Right Stuff. Uh, See, I've never seen that one, so it, it's part of my clowning. And I th- is it eighty three or eighty four? It's one of the two, somewhere in that vicinity. Because you know, I mean, it, it was the story about the uh, uh, the original seven. It was Ed Harris was in that, Scott Glenn, Fred Ward. You are right. I forget about that movie a lot because a I haven't seen it, and b it is not one that comes uh, front of mind because it's not one that's often as brought up as a lot of other movies. So I, I, I guess I apologize for that. <clears throat> That's fine. But I mean, I, I really loved, I wa- I read the book and then I watched the movie. I thought the movie was exceptional. Um, I thought the movie is greatly underappreciated and undervalued in Hollywood and among uh, cinema files. And I stand by that to that extent. Yes, I see that uh, you know that this is a, a novel film, but I think it's really building upon both the right stuff and really the more science fiction type thing, which is to so I downgraded it a little bit to that. That's fair, and that does leave us with an eight and a half, which is probably not a bad thing. I, I think you can split hairs a little bit, but it, it's good you brought that in because uh, obviously that was a blind spot for me. Classicness, I went with a nine and a half. First off, this is a period piece because, as we mentioned in last week's episode, and I think this was actually a very astute observation or a way of putting it by me, you're applying a modern sensibility with historical perspective to something that had already happened. And so because of that, the classicness is probably going to be there. There really aren't any difficult moments. They don't include anything that could be oddly out of place or or felt that um, it hadn't aged well. In fact, I think there are a lot of things that do age well in this movie from different actors or characters to, you know, how everybody handled themselves. Maybe there's a bit of a glossy finish to this that there isn't a darker set of characters, but I, I don't think that was the point of this movie. And so for everybody who's expect, or looking for a gritty movie, this is not your movie. Frankly, no Ron Howard movie is gritty by, by any stretch. <laughs> but that being said, I, I think the part where I really upgrade this movie is the sweetness, the sentimentality, the tone. All of the little emotions are there. And then when you talk about a disaster movie with all the, the thrilling elements of it, and especially the, the scene that I said was both the best and my favorite scene, the, the three minutes, is such an effective sequence yet, especially because I haven't seen the movie in a while. I think every time that you see that final moment where they're going through the, well, will they burn up? Was the heat shield cracked? All of those little pieces... It's still a hold your breath moment, and I think that by itself is uh, an element of classicness. So I gave it a nine and a half. Uh, I gave it a nine. So we're not that far off on this category for that very reason. I think it does hold up. It is a period piece, right down to, and if I remember right, I want to say that GM gave all the astronauts Corvettes. 
because they figured what better way to sell Corvettes than to have astronauts driving them. Have we and, given a 10 on any classicness yet? I don't remember it. And frankly, this is about as close to a full 10 as I, I think you can get. If we haven't again given a 10, I think I need to almost give this a 10 because they're really, I, I tried to find something to downgrade it with, and I, I just couldn't find it. All right, well, I could go up to... Well, I don't need you to go up. I think I'm going to give it a, a, a 10 for the sake of creating what the full 10 has to look like because we this has been always the most nuanced and difficult category i think we need something to set what exactly a 10 looks like in order to better understand what isn't a 10 too all right so that that'll take us up to an average of 9.5 your 9 and my 10 then so uh what do you have for rewatchability i know that this is a, a favorite of yours. This has always been one of those that anytime it was on cable, you're like, yeah, I'm going to watch, you know, 10 minutes of this and an hour later. Yeah, I know. And uh, uh, I'm going 9.5. The only reason it doesn't get a 10 is, is this is not something that I have the DVR necessarily set for to automatically record whenever it's on. But I will watch it and spend 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, watching the film again. And, uh it doesn't matter. It's it's worth sitting and just watching it and uh, living through that uh, the original time plus the time when I watched the movie and I was still a young man. There are certain movies that have an element of coolness and fun and give you a, a feeling of like energy or joy, and I don't think this movie has that. So I can't put it as one of those that I readily go back to or one that is just an enjoyable rewatch, which is, if you look at eventually what I'm going to give a 10, and we haven't gotten to that point yet, I think that there, are, I know exactly what are the 10 movies for me, I know roughly what the 9.5 movies are for me, and even the 9s, but one piece or element that I will add to this, and I heard it described on a, a different show once as this, it's the, it's, the definition of what a rewatchable cable movie is, and it's exactly what I mentioned before. Oh, I'm just going to watch this scene. Or, oh, I'm flipping through the channels and, oh, this is on. Yeah, I'm going to, oh, it's that part? Well, I got to watch that part. And it doesn't matter. You cancel your plans and you just start getting engrossed in the film. And then it's like, oh, well, an hour has gone by and I've watched the, the, the complete end of the film. And there are so many pieces to this. I've kind of beaten around it, but I haven't completely gotten to this point. I think because it doesn't become too heavy at any one point, there are good moments that break up all of the direness because you could certainly, again, in a lesser director's hands, have made this into just a movie about the astronauts themselves. But because you have the small breakups with what's going on at NASA and the interplay between Ed Harris's character figuring out one section of things. Then there are the guys trying to figure out the air filter. Then on another front, you've got Mattingly doing the simulator, Gary Sinise's character. And then you've got the home front, you know, Lovell's family and how they're re reacting to everything. I think they, they did a good job of balancing all of that where it's not overpowering. And so all of this is easily digestible. You can sit and watch 20 minutes without feeling the, the pressure of it, but uh, being engrossed in the movie at the same time. It gives you a thrill sense without becoming too much. And it's a really good balance. And so because of that, and also this movie isn't terribly long, it, you can do it easily in one sitting. All of the things that we've talked about is rewatchability. I ended up giving it an 8. So that's going to put it at an 8.75 uh, averaged out for the two of us. So audience score was an 87 for 8.7 points. So that was 7.75 for Legacy, 8.25 for Impact Significance, 8.5 for Novelty, 9.5 for Classicness, and 8.75 for Rewatchability, and an 8.7 for Audience Score for a 51.45. Uh, I only have one real remaining question, and I think it's one we've kind of already gotten into, and maybe it's a broader discussion that will need to be wrapped up 
when we get to that movie. But before we get to mine, because I think mine is kind of a finisher question, what did you have any remaining questions for this movie? I don't have any really remaining questions. One of the things I noted that I didn't realize until I was looking through and doing some research for the show, Fred Hayes' wife in the film, do you realize who that was? No. Tracy Rain, or, uh, Reiner. That's uh, Rob Reiner and uh, Penny Marshall's daughter, granddaughter of Carl Reiner. Oh, okay. So yeah, I would have never never known that. But I, given that I think Howard has a loose connection to Carl Reiner, I that doesn't surprise me. Well, it has to do with the whole thing of the fact that Penny Marshall was married to Rob Reiner for a number of years. And her brother, Gary, was the producer and director of Happy Days. So there's a long link between Happy Days and the Reiner family and all of this, going back for years as a result. My lone question, but I don't know if, now thinking about it, we can answer it now. I'm going to pose the question, and I think we need to revisit it when we do the other movie. Why Braveheart over Apollo 13? Personally, even despite its historical inaccuracy, I actually really love Braveheart, and I actually like both of these movies. So I I think there's a discussion to be had of the nuances, but given that this was kind of an upset uh, winner at the time, and Braveheart ended up sweeping a lot of the awards that year, kind of coming in as as a a relative dark horse early on, but uh, ended up being like the the one that performed the best during award season, I I think this has a longer discussion of what the awards were during the the mid-90s and how they kind of changed. So it's something that I think could be a a longer-form discussion. Yes, I would say uh, we need a long discussion because uh, Braveheart, to me, just seemed like a bunch of teenagers getting around or figuring out how to one-up the violence. No, 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 no. I, I yeah. think there's there's so much more to Braveheart than than the the small pieces of that. You're you're the person that would watch Game of Thrones and would only be picking out the really extreme parts of it, like the nudity <laughs> or the violence, and saying that that's the only parts you take out of it. When and it's part of the reason I ask something like, "What is this movie about?" Because if you only focused on those parts, you miss a really what something is about or its real essence. And Braveheart has nothing to do with its violence. That's just a part that's like a nice additive that keeps people interested. But it's not what it's about. <laughs> yes, yeah, so let's see how violent we can be so that people, you know, it's a nice part of the film. <laughs> I didn't say nice, but it does keep the attention. Okay, sure. Look at every Clint Eastwood western. Well, look at every Clint Eastwood film. So, <laughs> all right, all right. I wish we could talk longer, but I'm expecting a friend for dinner next week. We are doing a little-known comedy that Dana picked out, Mr. Roberts, starring Henry Fonda, Jack Lemmon, James Cagney, and William Powell. Currently available on HBO Max. So stick around in this feed for that one. If you'd like to get in contact with us, I've made this point a few different times, but greatest all time movie podcast at gmail.com. Again, that's greatest all time movie podcast at gmail.com. You too can be a part of our email list as we uh, continue to grow the show. The Greatest Movie of All Time is a production of Ronnie Duncan Studios. Our show is mixed, edited, and written by Thomas Duncan. Our music is thanks to Purple Planet Music. Our technical provider and distributor is Anchor FM. <laughs>